what you wanna believe, then you can leave it up to me, and I'll give you the key. It's easy. Just keep on hopping, keep on rocking, and don't start stopping. the show first of all i don't remember who followed who first but i was like this guy is awesome and so i've been following you ever since probably like over a year now i'm sure um and you're doing some really amazing things powerlifting which is really cool in and of itself but then you also only have one arm and that gets a lot of us thinking like okay what are my limits actually, right? Because it's so easy to give up on things if you feel like you have a setback and here you are crushing it. So I'm really excited to talk about this today on the show. Yeah, I'm excited to be here. Thank you. Well, so I guess the best thing to do would be to start with your story, what happened, and then how that progressed throughout all of this so that you could get into powerlifting. Okay. Yeah, so... um july 5th of 2017 i think it is i was down here uh visiting my wife on leave and it's it's kind of hilarious because i was actually set to deploy to qatar deploy like very loosely used because it's not a real deployment and i came down here because i was stationed up in delaware at the time and she was stationed down here in georgia and i came down here to visit her before i was going to go overseas and she had to work um like most of the days that i was down here visiting her and the fifth was like our first day going to be together for like two weeks while i would be on leave down here and so i'm just you know having a good time by myself i'm down at her dad's range shooting my guns and then like i get bored because it was it was super hot that day the humidity down here is terrible in the summer and so i was riding um a side by side a polaris razor i think it's i think his is an 800 or 900 cc engine and i don't know exactly what happened but when i was on one of the trails um i remember the razor like flipping over onto the driver's side his didn't have seat belts so it's not like I flung out um, the front of it I just skidded along the side along with the razor on the driver's side and the hospital like they said like none of uh like when they did the MRI or, uh, MRI or CAT scan that I had no like brain damage but I definitely think I had a concussion because mm-hmm. I was out for like a couple of minutes before I came to I was like, dang, like, okay, here's my right arm. Now where's my left arm? Because I'm like seated down and like laying on the side of that razor. And so I like grabbed my left arm because I can, I thought I could feel it, but apparently I couldn't because when I pulled it up and I started to stand up and come to, I realized that, um, like I looked down at my left arm because I like, it just didn't feel right at that point when I stood up and I looked down and it's literally hanging on by like this much of skin, like the artery, my brachial artery was severed. I had an open fracture in my elbow or not. I had an open fracture in my wrist and an open, openly dislocated elbow is what the doctors called it. I tore everything in the elbow that you can tear. And so I'm standing there for a second and I'm like, you know, you gotta, you you have to remain calm or you're gonna bleed out to death in the middle of the woods by yourself. So I'm sitting there and I just take a breath and I I pull my phone out uh, from my pocket on my right side and I call 911 and I I tell the operator what's going on. and, And at first, I don't think she took me seriously, 
because I was like, hey, like I need an ambulance. I just rolled over on a side by side. I severed my artery in my left arm. Like I need EMS now. And she's like, did you break it? And I was like, well, it's like openly broken. Like, yeah. And I'm sitting there and I've got my t-shirt wrapped around it as best as best that you can wrap it around something like that. I've had first aid training through the military, through like their self-aid and buddy care. And then I did a little bit of EMS uh, volunteering uh, beforehand, but it's not like I was an active member. I was just doing ride-alongs to get the feel for that kind of stuff. And so I'm sitting there waiting um, for EMS to arrive and I can hear like the ambulance sirens up by my in-laws house because it's probably like a half mile in the woods or so uh, from their house where I'm at. And I'm like down a steep hill and just like way back in there. Like it, it, like you have to take a pickup truck to like get back there. And so I can finally hear them coming. And then EMS and like a cop gets down there. And they're like dumbfounded how they're gonna like drive like get me up there because they don't want to walk me all that way because of how much blood I've lost. And so, you know, we they finally get um like a pickup truck down there and they drive us up. And I did ask for a cigarette because I smoked at the time. I was like, hey, does does anybody have a cigarette right now? Because I I can really relieve some stress right now. And the EMS guy, he, I, I was surprised. He actually let me smoke in the bed of the truck on the way up to the EMS. And then we're riding. Um, it's probably like a 45-minute drive to the hospital that they took me to. And I'm begging the uh, the EMT to give me some, like, morphine because, like, my adrenaline is starting to, starting to settle down. I'm starting to come back to reality a little bit. And he's like, no, like, I can't give you this because what if you pass out and you die? And I was like, I'm going to die from the pain if I don't get something to, like, kill the pain. And then finally, um, and it's something I've just started uh, recently remembering from that time is once we got to the hospital, I didn't really go into shock until they put me in the scat, uh, the CAT scan machine. and make sure I was okay in that from then. And then um, after that, I spent about two months um, recovering in the hospital there in Macon. And about halfway through my stay, so like my family at the time, they, they drove down from Ohio and came and visited me a few times, especially like the first week or whatever, um, initially after the accident. But um, about halfway through, so they, they, they took like my main vein in my right leg and they did a bypass in my left arm to restore like blood flow. Um, and they, they basically salvaged it the best that they could at the time, which it, it was all up in bandages. I had an external fixator and everything. And they did this bypass and about halfway through my hospital stay, the bypass in that arm had failed. It just, it literally just started bleeding out from the, uh, I guess it was, it wasn't a sling, but it was a, I, I guess we'll, we'll just say a sling um, is what it was basically in with the ex, external fixator and stuff. And it started bleeding through the bandages and, um, and luckily I had a nurse already in there, like that was like checking my blood pressure and giving like starting to give my pain meds and stuff at that time. And so I almost bled out like halfway through my hospital stay before I went home at, I think it was the end of August. Uh, that's when I finally got to go home with my wife to recover at home. And then, um, after that, it was like four more months of surgeries every week or every other week. I had, it was over 20, probably over 30 in that time frame. And they had me on Oxycontin for three times daily, muscle relaxers three times daily, and uh, 
they had a gabapentin i was on that like a really high dose of all three of those like the highest doses that you could have for six months mm-hmm. and it was just those first six months were like the most miserable six months being on all those uh plus what had happened you know those just made it worse Mm -hmm. now when all of this was going down i believe that somewhere you brought up not in this podcast but you've brought it up on your social media that you were just like no guys we're done doing all this surgery and stuff just take my arm off and they were they didn't want that to happen right they actually fought you on that yeah so like when I woke up like the first day or two after I, I don't know if it was the next day or the same day or whatever, but I kind of looked at it. And I was like, well, why the hell do I still have my arm? Like I seen how bad it was. Like when it happened, I thought they would have just chopped it off. Like at, on the day that it happened, I, I, I thought it was basically gone. And so like a week or two into this, I, I had been looking at other amputees um, on Facebook through some group. I met a guy that had like a BPI injury, a brachial plexus mm-hmm. injury. And he had had his amputated like a year after. I had reached out to him after I saw him doing like CrossFit stuff and, and running and all that. And he was like, yeah, man, like it, it was like the best decision that I ever made. And then I wrote read about like Casey Mitchell and Derek Wida, like their story. Like, I think Derek had his leg for like a couple of years after it got shot or whatever, and then had it amputated. So I was like, like, what's the problem? Like, I, I know the reality of the situation. Like my arm is like completely fucked. So mm-hmm. like, can we just chop it off? Mm-hmm. And the orthopedic doctor, he's like, I, I want to wait a year and let your nerves regrow um in your hand to see like what you can feel and hold and stuff and I was like so you just want to waste my time basically and just not get to the point that we know is going to happen Mm -hmm. and then I think it was February of 2018 where I had reached out to like uh uh, I want to say it was the med group on base and went through like uh, the wounded care guy to get me like a referral through TRICARE to go and see another orthopedic doctor and get his opinion on getting it amputated sooner. Mm -hmm. And I still technically had to wait like a year after my, after the initial accident anyway, because of all this other stuff. Mm -hmm. So the time comes to where you're like, okay, I'm going to have this amputated you have it amputated and then let's talk about recovery. Cause all you've got all this, I mean, I can only imagine you've got all this mid range time where you're sitting around with this obviously got to be extremely painful, useless arm. Right. And so then you've got to wait until you can actually start your journey to recover after you have the amputation done. So amputation time comes after they do that how did you feel like the pain was like, it was almost an immediate thing or more, I guess the word I'm looking for is it wasn't dragging on as far as the healing process goes. Um, like, are you talking about like the pain specifically with it? Yeah. Well, yeah. So, and even like today, like, but I think most of the pain today, like comes just from like my upper body days, mm-hmm. but like I did get, because my hand was so numb, like, I don't want to say there wasn't any pain, but like, sometimes it was hard to differentiate when there was pain, like your, your mind's almost like playing games on you, if that makes sense Mm -hmm. with it. Yeah. So yeah, that was, I guess, my question. So, I mean, obviously, there's a lot of mental pieces to this, right? Like, you had to make the decision to be like, okay, yeah, we're done with this. And then at so were you into powerlifting prior to the arm kind of sort of like i thought i was into powerlifting but i was kind of stupid and just like doing whatever the hell i wanted to um so in like 2013 i started lifting while i was again deployed um to a non-combat zone um 
I had uh, I met some Marines that we we worked hand in hand with like Marines, Navy, and Army um, at the transit base, um, the base you go to before you get to Afghanistan. And so I started working out with him, and then like a couple of the Air Force guys, like they were showing me. But like looking back um, at what I know now, um, especially after like a lot of the books I've read and working, well, not like working, but like training with um with the guys like at Dirty South because we've had a guy go to Westside Barbell like and mm-hmm. learning from those guys like I didn't know what the hell I was doing mm-hmm. prior to that I was kind of like into bodybuilding almost like um in 2013 that's like the time like you got Kai Green and Phil Heath at each other's throats so like I was really into that and I wanted to you know do Mr. Olympia you know at, at that certain time but afterwards once I started learning things and really lifting and training I was like powerlifting is like just so much better Mm -hmm. so I have to laugh and giggle about all this right because I think we've all been there in our like fitness journey some of us don't get any smarter but most of us do right we look back and we're like yeah, I, immediately with then get starting training, I was like going to be a bodybuilder and I was going to do all these things. And then you look back at how yeah. you were training and how you were recovering and you're just like, oh my God, I don't even want to talk about that part of my life, you know? But yeah, oh, yeah. so I have to have a little giggle about that. So so you, the arm is now gone. You decide you want to get back into powerlifting. How long did this take for you to to decide you were going to pull the trigger on this? And what did that look like? I'm sorry, you, it, my phone, it was breaking up a little bit right there. Oh, no worries. Um, So you decide that you're going to get back into powerlifting after you lose the arm. What did that look like? How long did it take? Um, So I started training like at, it, it's kind of like a commercial, like a local commercial gym. I started training there. Um, and the guy, the owner there, he was just buying the gym at the time. But he was telling me about um, these guys, and I was still doing, like, bodybuilding stuff or thought I was doing bodybuilding stuff at the time. And he was telling me about these guys that used to come in there, like, back in the day. They were like, yeah, they got this gym over naked. If you're really serious, like, here's his name. Message him on Instagram. And this is, I don't know, maybe, like, I think my doctor cleared me in like October to start lifting again. So this is October to December of 2018. He's like, you know, go over there. And I think the first time I went over there to really train with these guys was in February of 2019. And I started listening to uh, the guy who owned the gym. Um, He guided me and coached me a little bit towards my first meet. I had originally planned to do like a deadlift only because I was like, Oh, it's, you know, it's pointless for me to get on the platform and, and bench, you know, 85 pounds with the bar. And then I kept having friends like, they're like, Oh, you know, just, just go and do it, you know, just do all three lifts, you know? So I changed my meat entry for, I think it was like May of that year to put me in uh, full power and, I ended up doing the first meet in 2019 of May. So this is pretty cool because a lot of out of the box thinking probably had to happen. Now, I mean, I'm not sure how many people on here are big into fitness and whatnot. I know I have quite a few listeners that are some strong man and stuff like that. But I mean, deadlift, there's quite a few different kinds of con- like uh, adaptive stuff for deadlift. But you're taking it to a whole new level because we're talking bench that is that's really hard so the first meet that you did were you using a prosthetic for bench how did you do it what did it look like so no i i didn't even get my prosthetic arm um my my first real one i didn't even get until um dang well i guess i kind of got it like right after my amputation but it was kind of like a kind of crappy like Mm -hmm. it, it wasn't what i had asked for they didn't do like uh like physical therapy or anything with me so it was kind of like what the hell like what Mm -hmm. what am I supposed to do with this Mm -hmm. (laughs) and uh so the first meet I ended up just doing uh with bench I just ended up benching with one arm I 
I think it was like 95 or like 102 pounds. Like it, it's nowhere near what, you know, what, it, what my bench is with my prosthetic arm is, but I really only work, um, one handed bench for like two months before the meet. So maybe April and May I, is when I actually started to like bench with one hand and, and just say, well, fuck it. I like one handed bench for 95 or a hundred pounds is still mind boggling. If you think of the leverages that have to happen and the strain on the shoulder and the wrist, like you'd have to be compensating. Like there's, oh, yeah. that's crazy that you even went for it with that. So I'm like, dude, this is sweet. So, and then let's talk about squat. So you and I talked about this a little bit. I had a pretty bad injury to my shoulder back in January. They attempted to repair it and it didn't go well. And they angered my brachial plexus. I'm not going to call it a BPI because it wasn't full fledged, but I had zero use of my arm for like a solid five months. Um, And I had the craziest nerve things going on. I felt like I had Parkinson's disease. I would shake nonstop. (laughs) It was awful. Right. But I was determined to keep going. So here I am trying to come up. I know I sent you a couple months. I was like, hey, what do you think of this? Like, could you do this? Uh, I, but squatting is with one arm is scary <laughs> as fuck. <laughs> and, I don't think I squatted like six months until like after my amputation. Cause I was like, how the hell am I going to hold a bar? I mean, so when I watch you squat, I mean, and now you've had all this practice, I'm still scared. So I can imagine you go, you sign up for this first full power meet. I mean, what did you end up squatting and what was the trick? I mean, like, that's crazy to me that were you able to, did you use straps? Did you just do it like you do now? Or you just freehand it? What did it look like? I just freehanded it. And at this time, I, I had only like practiced like a couple of months. Uh, for squat like I had done it a literally like a handful of times no pun intended um but I had gotten uh somehow gotten like a gym lift of like 315 it was it was probably like two inches high though and I was like well I I guess I'll just like you know at, at the time I was doing holding my nub up with the bar on that side I would just really high bar the hell out of the bar and um probably put it too high at the time and then just you know put my other arm over there and hope for the best and I think I ended up squatting like 275 279 and I mean I still hate squatting to this day like it's it's miserable putting my one good arm up and I know like like I could get injured you know if I do the wrong thing or it might cause stress to my shoulder but I'm like well you know you got to do all three lifts so Mm -hmm. just just kind of like suck it up and I try to go for like the lowest squat amount right now that I got to get to my total that I want. I I like that. Uh, I could, I could feel you on that. I actually just got my hand started getting my hand consistently behind the bar again, you know, just recently. So, uh, things were, it was like safety squat bar forever. Right. Um, but anyway, yeah, so this is all really cool. So at what point were you like, okay, I need to find somebody that can make me prosthetics for powerlifting. Um, so I think the VA had called me, um, probably like two months after I had retired from the air force. And cause I just started going, yeah, it was, it was about two months because I had just gone to like my initial appointment with the VA and they were like, oh, do you want like to go through our prosthetics program? Uh, there's a guy here in Bacon. And I was like, well, it's kind of disappointing the first time I went through and got whatever the heck this thing was, which I wish I had a picture to post because that thing was hilarious looking compared to the prosthetics I have now. Um, and so this guy is in Macon and it's kind of hilarious because he's like two blocks over from the hospital that I was at when I was hospitalized. So I was like, why the hell didn't anybody call over to this guy, have him come talk to him if he wants his arm amputated so badly, explain what he wants, 
and then he could get the prosthetic that he wants. Like that mm -hmm. just <laughs> seems to make too much sense to me. But this guy, um, he had plenty of experience with arm and hand amputees because he worked up in Athens, uh, Georgia, and there's a bunch of chicken farms up there. And so people are losing fingers, hands, arms, like all the time, I guess. And so probably, I want to say like April or March of 2020 was when I got my first like real prosthetic. And then now your prosthetics are pretty sweet. I mean, you've got specialized ones for, it looks like you have specialized ones for every lift. Do you? Um, yeah. So I've got my deadlift prosthetic and I mean, I can use that for like farmers, um, trying to think farmers, uh, I guess uh wheelbarrow carries anything where I'm going to carry anything or like a deadlift. <laughs> um, and it's pretty pointless to bench without one because <clears throat> I'm sure you've seen it like in the video, like it's got like a hollow elbow and the forearm's adjustable and it's not, it's not meant to be pressed. Like it can't handle like the bench. It, it won't even handle like 225. Mm -hmm. um, and then once I figured out I could bench with that arm, that deadlift arm, once I saw that, I came up with the idea with my prosthetic guy. I was like, Hey, is there a way where we can make this like solid or whatever so I can bench with and it doesn't break? And he was like, yeah. And this prosthetic arm that I bench with take took forever to make it. It took a good five or six months because uh, they had to have, he said like the internal part of it, like where the elbow would be to the forearm is like welded together. So it can support like whatever weight that I'm going to bench. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because that's scary. We've all seen benches go wrong with people that have two good arms at a prosthesis and the ability to not get out of the way, and it could definitely get real hairy. Yeah, because I mean, I'm locked into the bar too with, with the hand device that's on there. So I mean, I've pretty much accepted the fact like, I've already died three times. Like if I die a fourth time, like just, just take me out. I'm ready to get <laughs> to that point. Well, and that's what I think sometimes when I watch you bench that you're connected to these things. Like it's like a clamp system. People can go stalk you on Instagram or whatever. It's a clamp system. You're hanging out with whatever's attached to you, no matter what happens with it. Yep. Like uh, eight man, they shared like one of my deadlifts and uh, like some guy commented on there. He's just being, you know, he's just being a jerk to be a jerk. He's like, Oh, so what if I'm I'm seeing is like if he tears a hamstring, like he can't like let go of the bar or get away from the bar. I'm like, yeah, I like I understand that. That's the that's a part of the risk. Like it's not like you know serious like death core or whatever you know, but like yeah, I'm accepting that that I might get injured and might have to stay with the bar for a little bit. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So I want to dive into the mental part of this. I'm sure it's hard or maybe not. I mean, I know people that have lost limbs or have some kind of injury where it's not hard, but we, I feel like we live in a society that's so quick to make a reason why they can't do something, you know, um, right. or they'd make a justification as to why somebody can do something better. Like so-and-so, uh, so and so can only work for themselves because their husband has a great job, or because they're a trust fund baby, or you know, like they. It's easy to make excuses for other people, and I, I are you know, for to justify why you may not be performing. So I'm sure you've watched people do that. I know I personally, when I my shoulder was injured, I had a client. Here I am. I'm working my ass off, right? trying to do every little thing that I can to keep things stimulated. And I'm doing everything with one arm and I have a client smash her finger. And I was like, Hey, I see you haven't been to the gym in a couple of days. What's going on? Oh, well I smashed my fingers really bad and I'm not able to work out. And I was at the time I was like thinking, are you shitting me right now? <laughs> like I've been working out for four months with no arm and you smash your fingers and you can't go to the gym and do some leg extensions. I mean, it's a little bit hard not to like have a little bit of a, I don't want to say grudge or like a, 
but to get a little bit aggravated about that kind of thing, right? I mean, like, kind of, yes, but also, like, no, because, like, I understand, like, like, it's not as serious as it needs to be sometimes, but, like, a smash finger, like, you know, like, okay, like, get the fuck over yourself. Like, yeah. it's, it's, like yeah. as long as it's not, like, something major, I don't think there's a reason to just, like, quit or whatever or, like, just skip the gym for, like, five or six days. Like, that's kind of, it's kind of dumb. Yeah. Um, well, and I, and that's where I was kind of going is we, we, it's so easy to let things get in the way of forward trajectory. So at one, at what point was there points where you talked yourself out of going back to the gym or were you like, I'm going to figure this out and it's going to happen. I mean, so when I came home from the hospital, um, I, and, and even in the hospital, like I, I was very negative um especially like that first day when you're like realizing what the hell's going on you're you're like you know like I had planned to be like a cop or a firefighter when I got out of active duty and moved down here with my wife and I was like well shit like I don't even know where I'm gonna be at in a year with with this thing like that's gonna be late I'm probably gonna get medically retired and you know you're just you just want everything to like kind of end um Mm -hmm. because I went through that like several there was probably like a lot of days like in the beginning um especially the first two months where I was very negative and hard on myself but I was like you know like after we get this done like we're gonna start lifting again we're gonna start training we're gonna maybe we'll do bodybuilding and because I knew that there were I knew that they had like the wheelchair division or whatever for like bodybuilding so I was like oh well maybe I could do that or like I said, in the beginning, I had reached out to that guy that did CrossFit um, with one arm. I was like, well, he can do that. Like, I, I can do powerlifting afterwards. Like, it can't be too, like, it's going to be hard, but, like, it can't be too hard to, like, at least, like, put up some cool numbers and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. And so, um, and then, like, my wife, she was on half days. So, like, she helped me through, like, a lot of it in that, like, there would be days where like you just want to quit and give up but like with her by my side like kind of like talking me through everything and pushing me to walk like in the hospital I was like okay like at least I can get up and walk and and do that it's like training at least I'm moving and doing something Mm -hmm. it may not be like lifting a barbell or anything but I can still still work around this and um there were I would say up until I got my arm amputated, I was very negative um, towards everything about it because you're angry at the world and you're wondering like, like why me? Why you? Mm-hmm. And I, I think that goes like, there's a lot of amputees that say, oh, I, I never think about that. Like, mm, I think you're lying because you, like you have to wonder like a little bit, like, is this like, is this how it's supposed to be? Um, Mm -hmm. So you kind of ask like a lot of questions about life and that mental aspect about it. Like, is, is this like the road that I'm supposed to be on or is it supposed to be different? And so you're always questioning like kind of things like mentally. um, And that was really weird experiencing that. And, and I mean, like kind of still to this day, I do a little bit, you know, Mm -hmm. um, but I mean, definitely after the amputation, I mean, I joke around about like, uh, like, oh, it must be nice to have like two arms or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, and of course, like I'm saying it sarcastically and as a joke to people. Um, I don't know where I was going with that, but I was tying it into that. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. I, and I could get that. I would totally, if something like that happened to me, I'd probably be so facetious about everything as far as like, Hey, you know, must be nice. Or like, you know, I can definitely right. see, I can definitely see some sarcasm happening there as well. But um, yeah. So, and I also feel like when you're going through a traumatic injury like that, not only do you have this extremely negative uh, incident that happened, but you also add pain and lack of sleep and situation and direct like your jobs interrupted no more routine you like got all these other things that affect 
your mood and your state of being outside of the injury too. And that can compound that negative feedback loop that you kind of get stuck into. Yeah. Cause I mean, like with as many pain meds as I was on and then like being woken up every four to three hours or, or whatever timing that the nurses were on to take like my blood pressure on at that time. Like, I mean, I was like kind of pissed off and irritated and then it just like made the negativity even worse. And it's like not trying to blame them because like I accept what happened. Like it was my own dumb fault. Mm-hmm. I was stupid. I was out there riding. I didn't even bother to wear like the razor didn't have a seatbelt. And I and it's funny because I had just watched like Travis Pastrana and like all those Nitro Circus guys riding on razors doing jumps. And they were talking about like when you uh, when you roll it, like you're supposed to like just tuck your arms in and just let it happen. And I was, of course, I was stupid, and I, you know, I probably put my arm out to brace myself. Mm-hmm. So you know, I I accept like my responsibility in that that it was my fault. It's not being mad or negative towards them. Right, right, totally. So let's talk about powerlifting now. So you're doing a bunch of big things and what are you prepping for right now? Um, so I'm going to be doing the WRPF nationals out in um, Las Vegas and that's at the end of September. Mm -hmm. So hopefully if I don't do anything too stupid, it should be a pretty good meet for me. That's awesome. I'm hoping I might, I might go because my teammate is competing down there and she's going to kick some serious butt. So Maybe I'll get to run into you down there too, but you yeah. just, you got done with the meet. You set a bunch of records. Uh, you know, you're just doing some really, it's, it's fun to watch how you, how you adapt to change. Like, so for example, like to work your pec side that you don't have an arm on, you're doing flies with like bands and you're doing all sorts of really think outside the box stuff, which is really, really cool to watch. Yeah, um, so I started out, like, the first, like, two or three months I was training, and even into, like, the first year, I was taking, like, a toe strap or, like, a row of wrist strap, and I was tying it to my knob, and then I would tie, like, an 80 or 85-pound dumbbell or even, like, the 70s, and mm-hmm. I would just do uh, dumbbell presses that way so I could still get the same exact weight but what I didn't realize was I was probably doing like more of a fly on that side. Mm-hmm. And so when I started training more at the powerlifting gym, Dirty South, um, and I saw them using bands and how they use them, I was like, well, if I just choke the bands around two dumbbells, it's probably going to be a lot easier, like pain wise. And I'm still getting like good work and. Mm-hmm. So I just started going to those and then uh, I use like a little cable attachment that's soft enough that doesn't irritate like the nerve pain that I still have. And I mean, I feel like I'm pretty proportionate looking for just using like those two little things. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Yeah. I mean, and you got some killer legs too. So <laughs> like, I see you being you. under six foot. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, I can feel that I'm a chick that's five foot two. So everybody's yeah. always like, you got crazy legs. And I'm like, yeah, that's all I'm made of pretty much. So <laughs> we got that. But yeah. So, I mean, in the, I mean, you're always displaying them with your cut off short jean shorts. So there's <laughs> that. Yeah. Well, if you could leave anybody with a word of advice, what would it be? Oh, man, just going to put me on the spot like this. I mean, you can think about it for a second. I'm just saying, like, there's got to be a lot of wisdom you've learned through this process and and things that you can share with people that might help them on their own journey. Um, don't quit and just keep going. I, I, I think that would probably be, if anything, because. There were just so many times where I did want to quit, especially those first two months. They were they were really, really dark. And then, of course, like when I came home and my wife, she she had to start going back to work because she's uh, she had just landed, I think, at the time, an active duty position in the guard. And they were nice enough to let her do like half days or whatever. And then 
she got this and so she had to go back like full time and so she helped me get through like a lot of it and to you know like stay and be here and you know live and just keep going no matter what Mm -hmm. absolutely and it's definitely a fortunate thing that you had somebody there too that you could 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 help you through the dark times right and be that word of wisdom so yeah well it's been awesome how can people follow your journey and watch all the cool things that you do and by the way you're super freaking funny so uh i get a lot of entertainment out of some of the things that you post on (laughs) instagram reels Well, I mean, there, there's so many good ones out there. So, um, but I'm at uh, one underscore armed underscore Hercules. So I love it. Yeah, your equipped powerlifting reel. I remember you posted that, and I just oh, yeah, yeah. about it's funny, died. I worked at an equipped lifting gym, and I, I wish I could. If I can get into a bench shirt, I'm going to do it one day. So it was that would be fun yeah my my son literally now he's 16 if we lift with each other and I haven't been equipped for a while because I'm recuperating but he literally goes the, you're in the shirt the bar lifts itself <laughs> yeah but you know I and I give our gym owner because he he's a big equipped guy he had the uh he had the 242 uh, multiply squat world record for a while I think it was like six or seven years is what he said and getting to like learn from like guys who actually understand equip lifting is once you learn from like those types of guys equip lifting becomes really cool and it makes you want to try it mm-hmm. whereas you know you get the internet tough guys just shitting on equip power lifting all the time and it's like if you guys understood how this works, you would actually probably like it a lot. Well, and like, I feel like, and I could be wrong here, but I feel like a bench or like a, not a bench or dink, uh, if a deadlift suit or like a squat suit would be something that would be totally logistic for you to jump into. Yeah, I jumped in, uh, I think it was a single ply Titan. Mm-hmm. Or something. It was it was like an old single ply uh, suit that they had, and I I jumped in that at the I want to see it, say beginning of like twenty one, and and luck would have it that my prosthetics harness broke when I I think we had two twenty five or three fifteen, and so I wasn't even, but I could feel like the pressure in the suit, the tightness, and even though I wasn't good at like bracing yet, I'm mm-hmm. um, still struggling to find that now, but. At that time, it was really bad, and as luck would have it, my prosthetic broke, like, on the first or second pull that I did with that suit, so I didn't even get to see, like, if I could really do anything with it. Yeah, and then that, oh, you know, so, okay, now now I'm getting into rabbit holes, like, I wonder if there's some way for meat. I feel like bent or deadlift and squat, you could easily probably get into co- equipment with that, well, squat might be a little sketchy because of your hold, but I feel like for adaptive, they've got to be able to maybe like a slingshot or something, you know, I don't know. Now, yeah. now I start thinking because you have so much surface area on that I other side. A, a slingshot, I think it was last year during the summer. Maybe, it, maybe I was just fooling around like in the off season or whatever. Mm-hmm. And I, I, I did get like a little bit of rebound with it. We didn't really work up to a heavy max or anything just because I knew from watching those guys do a clip that, you know, don't, don't try and max it out right away. Don't try and do anything stupid or anything Mm -hmm. and do like a two or three board just to see what you get out of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, okay. Well, when you get into equipment, I'm going to be following that too, because I think that, I mean, this is, that would be like next level stuff there. Cause people don't realize equipment is sketchy. It is yeah. scary. It is sketchy. They're like, Oh, it's cheating. And it's like, no, it will take your face off. If you screw it up. Like there's no, like right now I have a little bit of knee valgus. My coach is like, you ain't getting back in a squat suit until you can't, until you fix that. So, you know, um, it, there's zero margin of error and then you add different body mechanics to that and it can definitely I mean the technique learning it would be a blast but holy cow talk about I mean 
you're getting you'd be pushing one of your your fourth life for sure on that so yeah definitely yeah well it's been awesome chatting with you i'm looking forward to watching what happens at nationals that's going to be awesome and i really appreciate you joining me today yeah thanks again for having me i appreciate it